And now I'd like to turn the program over to Nima to introduce herself and our speaker. Great. Megan, thank you so much and really appreciate being here today. Uh, my name is Nima Maida um, and I'm a 2006 Owen graduate um, and am currently based in Nashville. It is a great pleasure to be here as an alum and part of the Alumni Board of Directors uh, at Owen and thrilled to welcome uh, Professor Kimberly Pace uh, today uh, and honored to introduce her. Um, in her own words, she is passionate about the transformation of leaders. Um, a little bit about uh, Kimberly, uh, we were just saying, we started at Owen at the same time 15 years ago. So, so much to celebrate um, and so much um, that Kimberly has brought to Owen. Uh, Kimberly serves as a professor for the practice of management at Vanderbilt University's Owen Graduate School of Management. And as I said, she's been there 15 years where she teaches advanced communication courses to MBA, masters of finance, uh, accountancy, and our executive MBA students. In the Vanderbilt executive programs, she also teaches our communication strategy for senior leaders, persuasive and influential speaking, as well as women in leadership courses. Kimberly is a frequent keynote speaker at conferences on topics such as executive personal brand, leadership communication strategies, cultures of engagement, and executive women. So thank you so much, Professor Pace, for joining us today and leading this discussion. I'm truly thrilled to have you here um, and look forward to what you're gonna share. So thank you so much. And Professor Pace, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Nima. I don't. I think we were about twelve when we were at Owen, right? We'll just go with that. That was fifteen yeah. years ago. And uh, Megan, thank you so much for hosting this. You have been a great um, co-chapter leader for the Boston area and for all of you around the country that are joining in for our discussion on women and leadership. So my goal is, in less than about thirty minutes, is to give you some thoughts and thinking about women and leadership, especially about whether you're thinking about it now or in the future, being in those top leadership positions. And so I do encourage you again, that if you have questions about anything that I said or just discussion topics that you'd like to have, do use the chat function. Um, feel free to put a question in there and we will do our very best to answer that and give us some time at the end. So when I think about um, women in leadership, one of the first things that I'll hear from research is we just got a pipeline problem, right? So we'll start with that. And there, that's not completely untrue. There's certainly a lot of research that talks about women just getting into the management position that many times promotions, when you get to those kind of mid to upper management positions, men will be, and sometimes it really is that men will walk in and say, I want this job and this is the reason you should give me this job. And there is some research, and I'm oversimplifying, where women are like, I have worked hard and have executed on everything that you've given to me, you should know that I want this job. <laughs> All right. And so, um, and there certainly is a big cha a change though. People quite often will say, oh, women aren't in major leadership because of family. But the reality is we're seeing that only about 2% of men and women are leaving businesses and, and because of focus just on family, because especially in younger generations, we're seeing dual incomes and people working in both ways in particular businesses. So pipeline can be one of the things, but one of the other big things is to really pay attention to even people applying for the job. Sometimes you'll hear companies say, well, we just don't have the people applying for it. And what I would encourage you to do is to look, go all the way back to things like job descriptions, because you can put them into software to look, is your job description actually recruiting um, women into those leadership positions that people or women would go, oh, that's something that's so me that I would be interested in it. So there's a lot of that as well as I do believe since women have so many choices in our leadership, um, they are looking for the benefits the company brings as well as flexibility. It's not about quality of doing the job, but making sure it's really is the right cultural fit for organizations. And in the recent study that just came out in the past few weeks from Gallup 
on how COVID has impacted the business. This is no surprise, I think, to anyone. Um, women, and I would even say also younger couples, but especially women, their engagement scores decreased during COVID. And the majority of the reason for that where other areas were really growing is because of responsibility of home life, whether that's caring for an elderly parent or caring for children. But this really was out of balance and how difficult it was. And the ones that did feel the most engaged, the ones that felt really support from their leadership. So there's some really interesting, even new research out there. I do want to begin though, as we think about women in the C-suite, in that executive CEO, CFO, COO, CMO suite, um, Things that I have seen and observed as I have done executive coaching that can sabotage your move. move. Now, let me say before I get into this, this is not for all women, and this is also not exclusive to men, all right? So this can happen for men and women, but they are things that I see quite often as I'm coaching women um, into these executive positions. So I would say my number seven, and we're going to go from seven to one, is don't wait if you want something, right? So if you want something, whether it's a flex schedule or you want a promotion or you want to try something different, don't wait for that opportunity to open up. Be willing to ask for it and just share that you're interested, even if it's something new that you're creating. I have a colleague um, that says quite often, you know, don't let other people say no for you. It's okay for people to say no, just don't let other people say no for you. And so don't wait on things that you might really want. Um, this number six is the sabotage is to not share too much information. Now, <laughs> I'm all about communications, right? So it's important to communicate. But sometimes in my coaching of women executives, I find that they like to explain the why behind it. So let's say that there has been a mistake made and they're going to solve it. I will see women quite often give me three paragraphs explaining what happened and then a really detailed of how they are going to solve it. When I could give the exact same exercise to some men in the room and sometimes they'll just say, sorry, this is how I'm going to solve it. <laughs> and that's it. Um, so the sense of making sure that as quickly as possible, you get to the solution and be very clear and concise and crisp um, in assertive in your answer. And then you can always say, if you have other questions, please let me know. Most of the time people won't. They just want to know that you have it taken care of. So being careful about that. Um, number five is ignore. And ignore means ignoring feedback that is given to you and being really open to feedback, even if it's hard. So I'm going to give you an example. When I was like 26 years old, a, um, I had a boss who happened to be another female that was in her late 50s, and she brought me into the office, and she told me that I needed to stop being so happy in all meetings. And I remember thinking to myself, like, just because you're older and have gotten really grumpy, this is not my problem. <laughs> That's what I was really thinking. Um, but the reality was, even though it wasn't perfect feedback, once I really got into the conversation, because I have a very bubbly personality, what was happening is I would, I would be very friendly, but then I'd get into the meetings and I would laugh a lot and kind of joke around. But the majority of the people in my meeting were all older males. And so just by not, not being authentic, but just kind of reining it in and being a little more direct in what I was saying during the meeting, all of a sudden, people took me more seriously of what I was saying. So it wasn't easy feedback to hear, but it was great feedback for me to have. And so always seeking out coaches and mentors and those people that can give you very honest feedback is helpful. Number four is to not abandon your goals. Now, what's great about this is in our day and age, you can go back to that kind of number seven, don't wait for what you want. I've heard top executives come in years ago and say, I want to run this project, but I'm going to do it three days a week in the office and two days a week from home. 
All right. Or I have friends that have decided to take off the first four years of their child's life. But in the process on it, they put themselves on some executive boards. So they had about two to three meetings a year on these executive boards and kept all their connections going so that when they did return to work, they didn't lose any momentum of their placement and what they were doing. In fact, had made some even richer contacts um, in the work that they do. So you don't necessarily have to abandon your goals if you have a particular um, schedule or flexibility that you want with your family is also important. Um, number three is to be not afraid to take risk. Um, this is a really hard one and it can be for lots of reasons. I know for my generation, I'll just say, um, there was the sense of like, work hard, but be secure, take care of your family, don't go into debt, like all my little voices of my mom and dad are like in my head. And the idea of just taking risk was not something that was very comfortable for me. And I would say for the majority of other women in my bracket that I hung around. Um, but it is important that we're able to do this. Um, Professor Nick Bolin, who's also at Owen, has done some amazing research on risk when it comes to gender issues and risk aversion. Now we can go into a lot of detail on this. Um, the good news is I will say as a, some of this research is I might not be as willing to take risks when I'm in my 20s, but as I get into my 40s and older, I get much more comfortable with risk. And that really makes a lot of sense, but we need to be able to do that. Now there is research and you've read this if you've been a part of other women in leadership events that says when, when women CEOs come into place, the overall risk taking is reduced like debt, volatility, and really the survival of firms and especially entrepreneurship can be much more successful with women leaders. Um, the only downside we have to think about is sometimes female CEOs, if there's a high growth project that's more risky, might be more hesitant to grab on that high risk job growth in those particular areas um, for it. But the reason I like to talk about risk is because of when we look at C-suite profiles. So if you look at the slide, there are all kinds of things in here about stakeholders and financials. But the second bullet point especially talks about things like vi highly visible roles living through crisis situations and leading a company through, taking on high risk situations and also managing challenges and adversity. Um, it's not that um, I know for some women leaders that COVID-19 is horrible it has been for our world. You really sometimes see where the real leaders are in those moments um, of how they have led those organizations and because of that have had some higher visibility in the work they do. So we wanna be able to take those risks. And so I just encourage you to think about, you know, what kind of risk have you taken in your career and what kind of risk might you be willing to take in your career in order to really go for it and be successful for that, for it. Um, the number two area is to make sure you are communicating vision and strategy. There is research out there that Corn Ferry, um, McKinsey, a lot of other people have been engaged in that talk about women being great managers, right, great leaders, because they're very good at emotional intelligence or listening to their teams. They're usually very good at what we call multitasking, being able to deliver on the items and the objectives that were given, right, really high in that area. And men and women see women as the very best at this. Yay. Okay, this is wonderful. But what's interesting is when they're asked about the strategy and the vision of where the company is going, men and women 
rate women as not as strong in this area. Now, when this first part, part of this research came out, I was a little like, hmm, like, is this true or is this a public relations problem? right? They just don't see us as that way and what's going on with it. And my guess is there's some of both, right? Some of it is probably just a perception of how people talk or see still because we don't have as many women in the C-suite and in those executive positions. And some of it could be also related to culture. I know for me, um, most of the women that were executives when I was were young were running great clothing stores and hair salons, but I wasn't know I didn't know any bankers, right? The things that we have now and leaders in these that we now see for it. So what is causing this? One of the things I would encourage you to do is to think about putting together a Junto group are a mastermind group. So Junto group, I've always been fascinated with what Ben Franklin would do, that he'd bring like plumbers and electricians and uh, all these different people together to talk about and to try to solve problems. And so how do we get out of that and listen to that? I know for me, I have a group of four other women that I'm a part of a mastermind group. And our real goal is to challenge each other, help each other to take risk. Um, and we all come from very different disciplines and it does help me think differently and have that strength to tackle things that maybe I wouldn't have normally done. Um, and there are so many examples Examples. Um, Adina Friedman, who is also an alum of Vanderbilt, um, has come to Owen multiple times to speak. She's the CEO of NASDAQ. And what I loved about what she talked about is how much when she thinks about strategy that she invests in the future. Like she spends a lot of time thinking about blockchain, <laughs> like really studying the trends and where things are going. Um, I've always admired um, Indra Nui, who, the former CEO of PepsiCo, that would talk about in many of her speeches, this idea of making herself better as well as her company better by improving the gap between kind of the top person and the next person. So she was always investing in leadership development and personal growth. You'll hear her talk about over and over again in every interview that she has for it. And Warren Buffett, I mean, he has the luxury of doing it, but I read a great quote that really stuck with me that where he was talking about that he spends 80% of his time just thinking, right? And in a lot of even coaching executives, men and women, just getting people to get two to three hours a week on their schedule, that they're just thinking about vision and strategy is really hard to do because we get into the day to day so fast. So we want to be able to do that. That also helps us to keep up where the trends are and where things are heading and really understanding everything from crowdsourcing to personalization to understanding. You know, I always laugh that people are like, I'm trying to understand the millennial generation. I'm like, OK, well, you're in trouble because they're like 37 and they have kids. And, you know, you got to understand the Z generation now and everything about the Z generation and understand how they work and how they communicate and what's important to them because um, it's different from the previous generation but really understanding the trends of where those things are going. Um, in this communication and strategy for me it is where do you put your energy. I have a one of my mentors um, Michael Burcham um, really challenges me personally in this particular area about am I putting my energy just in executing what I need to today or am I thinking about what we're going to be delivering in the future and spend my time and research investing in that to really understand that. In the communications part of it, what I see in this to not sabotage yourself is to make sure that you can clearly communicate your value proposition. Now, sometimes people will call this the elevator pitch. I know with my students, I called it the personal brand pitch, but it is always throughout your career at every stage of your career understanding what that value is that you really bring to the organization and what uniquely 
that you do and you bring. Now, this does change over time. As you gain more experience, as you gain more expertise in particular areas, you'll be able to adjust that value proposition and be able to add to it. But you've got to be clear of what that is and not vague, but have some real clarity in that particular area. I would also say the sense of um, maximizing training will help you in sharing strategy and being able to communicate vision and strategy. Um, the good news is there is some amazing research that says, especially as um, let's say that men and women are both in their 40s, uh, that women will continue for the rest of their career to crave feedback and really want the feedback. And sometimes, once again, it's not all, this is just saying, men will be like, well, I'm 40 something, I really know my stuff, I really don't need any more feedback. <laughs> you know, but the good news is we really do want to continue to better ourselves and learn more. So I find that not just taking courses or receiving new certifications keeps me fresh, but also cross training of roles and really understanding different roles. And within a company, when you go into a company, if you're in a particular department, making sure that you're reaching out to people in very different departments to build that natural relationship, that authentic relationship that also just increases your awareness of the entire enterprise. And the more you do that, the more it influences how you talk about strategy and how you communicate that and where things are going. And I would also just think about your kind of overall database. And I don't mean, I mean, you can, I know some people actually keep a database of who they keep in touch with and who, how they communicate with that, but being a very valuable resource to people. So for example, on your LinkedIn, I really do think about that if someone sends me a private message through LinkedIn that I know even if they're not asking me for something, I try to be a networker. I try to help them be successful and share other people with them. And that's a huge way because a lot of business promotions, um, so much of our reputational management is what other people are saying, of course, when we're not in the room. And so making sure that we're building that. Um, and I would also say in the communicating and thinking about the areas that you want to lead strategy and vision for companies, think about the kind of companies you want to go work for. Um, there are companies that are amazing for women. There are companies that are amazing for people that also want to have multiple kids and they want their kids to be on site at a daycare so they can stop by for lunch. I mean, those companies exist. And so I always say to men and women, um, really be choosy about the kind of culture that you want for an organization. And if you're in an organization that the culture does not have what you want, once again, go back to that number seven, like don't be afraid to ask, right? <laughs> don't wait for something if you want it, go ahead and ask for it. And then the number one thing that I think is important is what I call not forgetting to brand yourself. Now, I am not talking about your TikTok channel. I do have a TikTok channel for my dog, Liza Minnelli, but that's a whole different issue, my little shih tzu. Uh, but it's, this is not about marketing yourself or branding yourself in that way. What I'm really talking about is making sure that authentically who you are gets communicated clearly with other people that work around you. Because sometimes it's just hard to see ourselves and to really understand what is happening and what gets away. And I could give you a lot of case studies on that um, as I have worked with executive women about seeing yourself clearly for it. So I wanted to give a few tips on how to do this effectively to help you in your career. Um, one is just to make sure you have what I call truth tellers around you. Um, I call them my personal board of advisors, right? So this is different from my mastermind group. These are people that if I go to and ask them to give me feedback, they will. I've told this story before. So Nima, you might've heard this, but um, I had a, I had a significant birthday. I'm out of the country and uh, 
my one of my close friends flies in, meets my husband and myself, and he's exactly 10 years older than I am. And I said to him, as I move into this new decade, um, what advice do you have? And he said, do you really want that advice? And I said, yeah, I really want the feedback. And so it goes on like a couple of more times, like the third time I'm like, no, I really would like to have this feedback. He's like, you really want the feedback? And I'm like, no, I really want to know, like, you know me, what as I'm looking at the next 10 years of my career, what kinds of things would you, you would encourage me to think about? And he says, okay. So he starts. Two hours later, he finishes. And I didn't sleep well for six months. Now, the reality was it completely changed the way that I teach, the way I do consulting, the way I think about things. It was such powerful feedback, but it was a lot on like where my priorities are and why, what I needed to probably shift if I wanted to get to the goals that I had for myself. So make sure whether it's a coach or an advisor that you have these people throughout your career no matter when it is that can give you that reality check. So there's a book called Building a Brand Driven Business by Scott Davis and in it is this definition and one of the things that I want to say about when I think about brand is two things. One is this word in here consistently. So I want you to think for yourself if I went into your closet and I opened up your closet door how many of you would have everything perfectly organized in your closet? Like everything organized. Now, if you are going, yes, of course, doesn't everybody? I'm going, congratulations, that's wonderful. And I also don't understand you. <laughs> like, I love these people that do this because people that have everything organized in their closet are probably pretty detailed oriented and very organized in other parts of their life. Now, I love that. I love that idea. <laughs> I can do it for short periods of time. I can do it when I'm leading a meeting, uh, but it is not my authentic greatest strength. I'm like the ideation person that comes in and loses their keys all the time. The other thing about this is this word differentiated. So what it goes back to that value proposition of always making sure that people know what makes you unique that you bring to the organization. If not, it's just too hard to kind of blur in, like blur in with everyone else. Um, like, oh, that person's smart, they're good, but, but they're not gonna become top of mind when I'm sitting around the table talking about this next big role for you. So I love models. And so this is a model that I use with all executives as well as all the students at Vanderbilt. And it's just this model that basically says, pre-presence is before people meet you, presence is when people meet you face to face and post presence is after the meeting's over. So here's the easiest way to think about it. Like before, pe before you meet someone else for the first time face to face, what are things that influence what you think of them? Okay, what are things that do that? So some of the things for me, I would say is curb appeal. And what I mean by that is if I Google them, <laughs> like what do I see? Um, what does their picture look like? Where did they go to school? Um, did I see clubs or organizations they've been a part of or nonprofit? Where did they even work? What's their title? Like all those things start influencing me very quickly just from what I'm reading, like in a resume or a LinkedIn profile or anything else that I might find. This is not as much fun. I will side note, this is not as much fun as it used to be. Before people understood privacy settings, this used to be really fun. So like back in Nima's day, oh my gosh, the stuff I could find on people, not Nima, of course, but the stuff I could find on people and put up like, oh, it's so nice to meet you for the first time and I would put up pictures and like half of the students would like run out of the classroom and like trying to figure out privacy settings. Now everybody's got the privacy settings on. But anyway, curb appeal, that's a big one. Um, the other thing I would think of is like what goes back to your expertise? What are you really good at? What can I recommend you for? Um, if, I, if I meet you and I'm now, what, what can I tell other people about you? Um, your reputation also. So much of reputation um, is really set by what I mentioned before, what other people say. And so what I think about in this area is that phrase we'll hear sometimes around sponsorship. 
right? Who are people that advocate for you when you're not even in the room? That you haven't necessarily asked them to advocate for you, but when your name comes up, it's not like just your boss that's advocating for you, but it's like three other people are like, oh yeah, I know that person, da 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 da, and they're advocating for you, or I just met, or have you met, right? And the only way to do that is by building those authentic relationships with people throughout the organization, not just in your own area of your building. Um, the other, this is a kind of a big pet peeve for me, so I always have to bring it out, is your writing can really impact your brand in the pre-presence. Uh, people, it's clear, right? We all know this. We can all think about this. It's clear that a lot of people should not be using email right? They just shouldn't be using it. Uh, and, and it has to do with it's too long or it's not clear. They, it's not professional. Or maybe they're using preaching language, which is like, as I have mentioned yesterday in the meeting, right? That's kind of preaching later. And I have found a new trend that's really been disturbing, which is lots of negative words are showing up in emails. So unfortunately, however, those are not inappropriate words, but in email and in executive writing, they're really not needed. They're filler words. Just be very clear and concise and really think about what does it mean to have an executive tone in your emails as you're communicating and sounding like an executive. Now, presence is you've just met someone for the very first time. They walk up to you and start talking with you. What are things that influence your perception? very quickly in those moments. So not surprisingly, there is that kind of first impressions. It can be anything from how prepared, um, how I saw them treat the administrative or the receptionist as they walked in the door. Um, I think a lot about are they aware of the mood of who's in the room and kind of matching that mood? And are they picking up and remembering small things? So if I meet someone and they kind of say, oh, I've gone on vacation or, oh, I've been out of the office because I've been caring for a sick aunt. Those are things that I remember. And so that next time I see them, that I'm really paying attention to that. The mood one I do think is the hardest because it takes a very high emotional intelligence. It's that Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, right? Being able to read the room. Can I walk into a room and read body language, feel the room, which is a little hard, been harder to do in this virtual world and be able to measure mood so that I can adapt my presentation in that particular moment to help really ease that and not just kind of bulldoze what I want to say to every single group the exact same way. In the brand, one of the things I want to challenge you to think about is that when I'm trying to be uh, persuasive, so this is not just in day-to-day -day conversations of someone I've known for a long time. People take this research out of contact out of context all the time. But Moravian's research on liking, on feelings and attitudes has to do with as someone is trying to persuade you, if I'm trying to persuade you of something, uh, especially in a first impression, I've got words, tone, and body language that can, influ in, in, that can influence the liking. Okay, the liking. And so you think about 100% is the message, how much would you guess the words would be? How much would you guess the tone would be of the voice? And how much would you guess the body language to be? Now, part of this that you've probably seen before is that 7% of our words, 38% is tone and 55% is body language. Now, let me be very clear, words still really matter. The words that we say. Now, we could do some research on this in politics that sometimes words don't seem to matter. Like people will cheer for people like, oh, that's such fabulous answer. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm like yelling at the TV. That was not a good answer, right? But for some reason, the tone of the voice or the body language connected with the crowd. But we do need to be very aware um, in our leadership positions that not just the words around strategy, risk, communicate what we're communicating, but the tone of our voice and our body language. 
And yes, there are some intentional and unintentional biases that show up in this, but we have to just be very aware of it. So I can give very direct feedback. I don't have to give a lot of extra words around it, but I can still use a warm tone that feels authentic to me. And I've had executives tell me, oh yeah, yeah, that's really helpful. They're really, and they'll come back to me like 20 minutes later, like you basically just told me I was terrible but did it in such a nice way that I totally agreed with you. And I was like, oh, I'm so glad you understood that. Right? <laughs> right. So being very aware of our tone and our body language, uh, even something as simple as I see so many times women standing up in front of people speaking at a live will lean to the left or the right. They just won't even stand up straight. So that small thing that you do might show a different level of confidence when you're speaking in that moment. Um, and just working on, I would say overall, just your persuasion skills. So this is everything from certainly your facial expressions, your body language, your eye contact, being able to look people directly in the eye. And even in the visual world, if you see that little green light, you have to look through the green light um, to really be able to connect with people and think about who's on the other side as if all of you are just sitting in my living room, all right? And gaining some additional skills and how to really build persuasive arguments with logic and emotion, being really good with data, great with business storytelling, all of those things will help. And being a great listener also really helps your brand listening deeply with actively with purpose, being able to listen between the lines, not think about what I'm going to say next, right? Don't act like I'm listening, but not listening. Really being able to pay attention to the body language, the words, the breath, how people are communicating to deeply listen will really change so that when you do ask a question, the question is a deep quality question. Right. And the only way to do that is through that very that, and I just think it's a skill you can develop of being a very deep listener. Um, I would encourage you and your brand to be great at leading meetings, whether it is in person or virtually. You can all think about meetings that you have to go to this the rest of this week or next week, and you're dreading them. All right. And there's a few meetings, maybe just a few that you're like, oh, I look forward to that meeting. It's going to be organized. We're going to get something done. I'm not going to be bored to death. Right. So really gain that as an art form and be one of the best in your company at leading meetings in any format that might come your way for it. And then the final thing I just want to point out, and then we're going to go to our Q&A, is in the post presence. So this is after the meeting is over and the person has walked out. Right, certainly we think about um, like how well they followed up with us. That can have a huge impact in what we think. I think one of the biggest ways that you can have an impact though in this area is the quality of how you say thank you and the ways in which you say thank you. Because all of us remember a thank you when it's very personal and it was unexpected. Right, very personal, it was unexpected. And so um, on that light, I do wanna thank you. Uh, sometimes coming to webinars and just listening to another person, uh, I want you to definitely ask questions, but it's always my honor to uh, be with the Vanderbilt alums. And I'm very thankful to Megan and Nima and the whole team that's been working behind the scenes to put this program together. So I'd like to, I'm gonna turn it back over to Megan, but some of the things that I'm thinking about coming out of this are, you know, what kind of risk and questions around risk? How are you spending your time working on the business as well as, you know, anything around your personal brand strategy that I can answer? Um, thanks so much, Megan. Great. Thank you, Professor Face, for a fantastic presentation. Um, it's really thought-provoking topics and some great advice to take forward. Um, I'm going to kick off, with, kick off with a couple of questions that we've had come in, and then I would also encourage participants to continue submitting any questions that you have um, through our Q&A function. So to kick off, um, I'm going to touch on that first topic that you had on the screen there around risks. And so can you 
Professor Pace and also Nima talk a little bit about the risks that you've taken in your career um, that you would encourage women to take and also how that differs for women in different points in their career coming right out of undergrad, maybe a little bit further in their career and then later on as career switchers. Nima, I'll let you take this one. I've talked it off. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kimberly. You know, so risk is such a big part of everyone's career, right? Um, but I think there are pivotal moments when when you take risks about saying yes or no. For me, a, a big example was just even coming to Owen um, and, and getting an MBA when I knew I wanted to be in HR, right? I, I knew that was a risk doing that, but I understood the value that the MBA was ultimately going to have for me. And I've seen that play itself out in my career. Um, you know, I took some risks in, um, you know, taking a job in China, right? Um, and saying yes to being moved around the world a few times over. <laughs> and then there was a time when I was offered a role in Zurich, absolutely beautiful, doing a really amazing role on talent acquisition, bringing leaders into an organization. And I realized that really wasn't right for me because that was much later in my career. I had really wanted something quite different and, and have a much bigger view of a business versus standing in a center of excellence, right? And so I had to take that risk to say, gosh, you know, I could go on to this job. I'm going to love being in Europe. I had already lived in Singapore for four and a half years. And I realized, you know what, it wasn't right for me. And I would do a disservice to me and the organization by saying yes. So I did something crazy and said no. Packed up everything in Singapore and took an 18-month sabbatical to really think about what was right for me, did some nonprofit work. So, you know, I think as you go in your career, you're gonna find you're gonna take risks for certain reasons, and you're not gonna take risks for other reasons, right? Um, but the best advice I can give you is really take the time to self-reflect on what is happening in your life, what is really important for you, and as Kimberly said, you know, those sponsors, those mentors, that think tank, I use mine all the time and my personal board of advisors. Having that support system helps me take those risks, but I know I've managed and mitigated the consequences because I've thought them through, right? And that's probably the biggest thing I would say is, use all of that thinking, use the people around you, and remember to reflect on what's important in your life in that moment, knowing those things change over time. So yeah, that's a, a little bit on risk. You know, it's, um, I think it's an ongoing journey for all of us as we continue in our lives, things change. COVID has changed a lot of things for people. They're taking risks, maybe that they thought were impossible to take before. And, and now we know that there are different ways of working and people are willing to take other risks. So I'd really encourage people to think about, are there different ways of doing what you do that you can still be passionate about? Um, it doesn't have to be a traditional way of doing things. And, and maybe Kimberly, that's a nice segue back to you. You know, when, when you took the risk of, of coming to, to Owen, you talked about how your style was very different. Um, what was that risk-making decision like for you? Um, yeah, one of the things I would say that's a little different maybe about me is that I have always loved risk. Uh, whether that, some of that's probably my performance side. So if you've ever played a sport, 
or you played an instrument, then you kind of love someone screaming at you and telling you <laughs> what you're doing wrong and how to get better. And we learn all of that, right? We learn that in sports and not maybe screaming, but, you know, really pushing you. And mm -hmm. I learned that as a musician and in playing sports and really have just carried that through my whole career. And so if I'm not being pushed or I get, I get bored, then I'm already ready for the next really hard challenge for it. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of other good questions here, Megan. Um, which one do you want us to tackle next? Yeah, um, there's a great, great question in the chat about how to brand yourself as a female executive um, while balancing, you know, the, the sometimes stereotypical view of being too assertive or aggressive. So how to, how to, you know, find that balance as you move up in leadership roles as a female. Yeah. So one of the things I always like to say is um, being assertive is a great thing. Being aggressive is not. So, you know, being really clear what those words are. And I will say that once again, there is some bias that shows up in this area that we know exists. So we can just say that. Um, what I find, though, for me is that for me, I will say tone and body language make the big difference. So I'll give you an extreme example. I had an executive much older than I was, this is when I was probably in my late 20s, um, that said, hands down, very clearly a sexual harassment comment. And if you've not been sexually harassed, then kudos. I think it's wonderful, but I do think it's very common, especially for younger women. And um, in that moment, I remember saying, may I offer some feedback? And I just went straight to that. And they said, yeah. And I said, I'm going to help you for the rest of your career to be successful, you cannot say that to me or to any other woman for the rest of your career, or you will be fired and you will lose your career. Is that helpful feedback? And the person was like, well, yeah, I mean, I didn't mean it that way. And then I said, it's okay just glad I was able to give it. And then I smiled, I went right on. <laughs> and it's amazing that person never again, right? So I think sometimes it is, and there are certainly appropriate times to be assertive. But mm -hmm. when I think assertive, I think about being clear and concise and really organized. Um, I don't over apologize for things. I will see sometimes women quite often will say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'm like, what are you sorry for? That, you know, sometimes there's times to say that but it's not very often and we also have to be careful not to say things like I think or I believe but just be more straightforward mm -hmm. the good news is and I will thank um, my predecessors as well as new generations um, dressing more feminine wearing dresses wearing color there are so many things that have been so much more acceptable in business now that allow us to do that. Um, so just be aware. Now, I am working with a woman executive right now um, that just kind of scares everyone, men and women, like she scares everyone. And some of that is that she doesn't smile. She is super, not just assertive, abrasive in her language. And so what we've really had to work on is to not be abrasive. Like you can be clear and concise without saying you suck. Right. So um, how do you do that in choice of language? So it goes back yeah. to words, tone and body language. Yeah. And I would agree too. you know, as I work with my executive teams as an HR leader and, and supporting them, you know, the thing that I will say is be authentic, be who you are, but remember, you need to adapt your communication skill so that you can have clear intent. And so that's what it goes back to, right? So if you need to be more clear, brief, then do it because that's what's going to help get the message across. There are going to be some people who are going to need a lot more and then know when to give that. I think as long as you are being authentic in that, this idea of aggressive, um, assertive tends to go away because people see who you truly are and it goes back to um, what Kimberly was talking about is your brand, right? When people know how you're coming across your intent um, and your credibility, you've delivered. At the end of the day, if you're not delivering, none of this matters, right? So that's the advice I give my leaders as well. And I work with, in fact, most of my leaders today are female leaders. My COO is a female leader, my business leader 
is a female leader. My manager is a female leader. So, you know, there are ways to be successful as yourself, right? But remember, you need to also adapt and flex. Great question. Building off of that a little bit and, and being yourself and identifying your brand, we had a great question about finding your place in an organization, but also on your own. Maybe there's women out there who are looking to start their own businesses and or are in the middle of career transition. So do you have any additional advice there around you know, finding your place and, and building your brand outside of that organization as well? Yeah, I definitely think that you have to work on both ends of it. So internally, certainly finding mentors um, and you can seek those out for yourself. Never being afraid to just ask someone to go to coffee or stopping by someone's office and getting to know people um, to be able to connect with them. Um, Getting a sense of what other job opportunities are out there, volunteering for key committees that are high visibility, all of that can help you internally. Um, And then externally, um, I would encourage you to look not just at people in your own industry, that certainly helps, but look beyond your industry about connecting with other, I know for me, connecting with other really strong women in other industries has been a very helpful part of my career. And showing up to some like association meetings, whether it's healthcare associations or investment banking or getting engaged in the entrepreneurship. And if you're looking at something, doing something truly on your own, I do think there's some great resources out there. And especially women entrepreneurs are really helpful to engage with other women entrepreneurs. And I I, kind of play off of that because I see the second section. So I know it's just don't want to lose this other question. Laura, thanks for asking. Is that I'm is that I do feel like we do have a responsibility as women to help other women be successful in this. So whether it's internally within organization, I'm looking at other women and legacy and how to help them to be successful to navigate. Um, I'm known as someone that if someone's trying to look for a major career change or they're looking for an executive coach or they're just kind of struggling with kind of like I've got 10 more years of my career what I really really want to do um, I find myself doing coaching with these people on a regular basis and some of it's also just to give back we have a responsibility to do that to help the next generation because sometimes even I will even say for students for example um, they're like oh the, um, discrimination doesn't really exist right and I would love to say it's gone uh, but it it hasn't changed as much as maybe we still want it to and so it's important that we support other women and help answer questions of how to navigate and be successful great um I would say there are also great, you know, um, external organizations that provide a lot of mentorship. There are women in leadership positions um, through the chambers of commerce. Um, There are usually many communities that have uh, women in leadership communities that you can join. Um, Organizations like Elevate that are meant for global women to join, get mentoring. Um, There's some fantastic resources. that you can reach out to. And, you know, the best thing is now that we know we've got this amazing thing, the internet, um, (laughs) you can access them, right? But I also encourage people to think through their alumni organizations, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, That's also a great way to build your network and and reach out to people that you've already got a common ground with, Um, you know, and that's one of the things we've done here today, right? Um, And this is a perfect example of that and networking. Networking doesn't have to be painful, but it should be purposeful. Mm. Yeah. Great, thank you both. And just wanted to plug one other organization that I was uh, recently a part of, the Forte Foundation, Mm -hmm. um, which is really geared at women who are in undergraduate or in their early careers looking at at business school, um, but was able to really connect with some great um, older female mentors who are, are more experienced in their career through that program. All right. Um, One thing that's come up a couple of times in our conversation tonight has been the concept of both mentorship and sponsorship. Um, Professor Reese, could you talk a little bit more about the difference between the two um, and how to kind of utilize both finding mentors and, and finding sponsors as you go through your career? 
Yeah, so I really see uh, mentors as people that I have formed a relationship with. It can be, I will say sometimes people feel like it has to be formal. It can be informal. These might be people that three times a year or once a quarter I try to take to lunch, right, to hear about how they've handled situations or ideas that they have, um, people that can guide me if I'm trying to make a decision about A or B that help me think through the pros and cons of both or to help me to see the blind spots in something that I'm doing. Um, so all of those that ask really good questions and ask hard questions, you can seek out on your own or you can, there are certainly, once again, a lot of networks out there to help you to do it. Um, but just ask, even if people don't, sometimes I think people that are in their careers, I feel like, like I can't mentor everybody is kind of how I feel sometimes, but can I have coffee with someone or have a Zoom chat to help them think about their career and questions? People usually can do that. And if they form a real connection with you, it'll continue. Sponsors for me, um, I know they have some formal things in organizations. I think of that as more organic. Um, people that I'm going to get to know, I'm going to work on a committee with or a project or a high risk or an adversity with, and they're going to get to know me and my reputation that are outside of my normal group so that when I'm not in the room, they're being able to recommend me to other people. Now, sometimes I'll even ask, let's say I've gone to an event and I see this person that I've decided is my, uh, you know, sponsor in a sense, I might say to them, do you know, do you know MK, right? Or do you know Megan? And let's say I didn't know you, Megan, I might say, would you mind introducing me to that person? And I just ask that person to make the introduction and it makes all the difference in that moment. So that's the simple thing you can do. Love it. And, and, you know, many companies do have formal mentoring programs, sponsor programs. So if you are part of an organization, you know, ask, talk to your HR professional, talk to your leaders um, and find out if there are, you know, uh, formal mentoring programs and how you can join them. A lot of companies also have them through their employee resource groups, um, such as their women and leaders, or if they have a black employee resource group, you may wanna check some of those resources as well. Excellent. Great, thank you both. I know we're getting uh, right towards the end of our event here, just another minute left. So just wanted to give an opportunity um, for any last words of wisdom for anyone on this panel. Um, so do you want to start with you, Nima? Any last words of wisdom for our attendees today? Um, you know, just first of all, that you even took the time for this says you're investing in your future. So I want to just say thank you for that. Um, and look, there's no silver bullet. There's no one way to get there. But the more authentic you are, the more true you come across. Um, and you really take time to think through what is important for you to present, um, it, I, that is going to make a huge difference, right? Don't try to be something you're just genuinely not, because um, it will come through. Um, and, and it does, you know, and then that is your credibility, your reputation. So that's the biggest thing I would say. Be authentic, be you. And my final <laughs> word would just be the sense of when you're thinking about what's next in your career, to not be afraid to ask for what you want, um, to not be afraid for people to say no, to not be afraid to take risk, and to find other people to help you along this journey. So it's been great to be with you. I do invite you to link in with any of us uh, so that we can stay in touch. It's great to be a part of this Vanderbilt network. And special thanks um, to Megan and to the Boston chapter for helping organize this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Nima and Professor Pace, for taking the time tonight and, and sharing some great advice and, and all of your experiences with the group tonight. All right, we're going to wrap up our event. So we'd like to thank everyone for attending tonight's panel. Uh, we do hope to see you again soon at other Vanderbilt events, both virtual and in person. Thank you again, and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.